Good morning, and welcome to the Third Dimension Blog Podcast. My name is Robert Nobel, and I will be your host as we look back at the history of aviation, as well as touch on other subjects from time to time that are of special importance to us as aviators. The question of the day, is job security as a professional pilot a myth even in the best of times? I am currently working on an article for June that will lay out the historical data on the RJ issue and how it has and will affect airline capacity over the next five years. I hope that those facts will add a new perspective to your viewpoint that a hiring boom may or may not be imminent. However, this week I want to go back and talk about the union that picked up the ball after the post office turned over the airmail service to the airlines and set a new standard for pilot pay. The roller coaster years of 1927 to 1937 brought about many changes in the airline industry. But before we talk about the next level of regulation that began taking shape in 1935, I want to revisit the changes that took place for the pay scale of pilots. The newly formed companies initially followed the post office formula because they had been informed that pilots were to be considered quasi-governmental employees. And any airline that wanted to change the formula and cut pilot's wages was running the risk of losing its government contract. This was a fairly simple but effective strategy, but an event in 1929 changed everything, and that event, of course, was the Great Depression. The Depression of 1929 brought about big changes to the post office formula, partly because of cuts in the subsidies paid to the airlines, which was due in part to faster and larger airplanes. But because the airlines had abandoned the post office formula between 1931 and 1933, this cut in subsidies was probably minor compared to the worsening economy caused by the Depression. By 1932, three alternative methods of payments were used to pay airline pilots. The first method was a base pay plus a mileage rate, which was used at United Airlines. The second method was a base pay plus an hourly rate that was used at American and TWA. And the third method was a flat salary which was used at Northwest and Pan Am. The important part in all that we have brought forward here is that as long as the U.S. government was involved, then professional pilots were paid as professionals. However, as the balance of power began to shift away from the professional pilots, true value to commercial aviation, there was another battle brewing that would shift the balance of power back to those professional pilots. The National Recovery Administration was to hold hearings on setting a new standard covering wage, and this was presented by the Aeronautics Chamber of Commerce. The ACC was proposing wage and hour rules for all airline employees, including pilots. In August of 1933, the ACC submitted to the NRA a code covering wages and hours for pilots. This code prescribed a minimum wage of $250 per month and a maximum of 110 hours per flight time. In addition, there was a provision of the code that allowed the airlines to choose between paying an hourly or monthly rate. However, nothing was mentioned of paying a mileage rate. We can look at this as being two steps forward and one step back, but there was an unexpected twist. The Airline Pilots Association, which was formed in 1931 under the leadership of David L. Benke, soon entered into negotiations, and based on the recommendations of future New York City Mayor LaGuardia, who was also an ex-congressman who would be the star witness for the pilot's position during the code hearings, ALPA adopted the position that the pilot should be removed from the code's provisions. The argument to support this position was predicated on two principles. The first was that the minimum wage provision should not apply to airline pilots because they were professionals, and the proposed code excluded persons employed in a professional, managerial, or executive capacity. The second was that the maximum hours a pilot can fly on a monthly basis was already regulated by the Department of Commerce, who was in charge of airline safety. The NRA ultimately decided to exempt the pilots, and although there were a series of challenges by all concerned on both sides, it was the NLB that finally resolved the debate and issued a ruling on May 10th, 1934. This ruling prescribed a complex wage formula which consisted of four parts, base pay, hourly rate, mileage rate, and hazardous pay for flight over hazardous terrain. 
The base pay was fixed, but the hourly rate varied with the speed of the aircraft, which could range from 125 to over 200 miles per hour. The mileage rate was calculated as additional pay for each mile flown over hazardous terrain and at speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour. The ruling also set limitation on hours as well as establishing 85 hours of flying as the monthly maximum for all pilots. This ruling granted professional pilots a generous share in the productivity gains due to improved airline technology, and although an hourly rate was incorporated into the formula, the essential element was the mileage rate. By the end of 1930, almost every mile, mile flown was done in excess of 100 miles per hour, and therefore the pilots were entitled to considerable mileage pay. Next week, we continue with our look back at the beginning of commercial aviation, but until then, take some time to look back, connect with your past, and remember, as an aviator, you are a gatekeeper of the third dimension regardless of the rating on your certificate. We all must be professional in our conduct and thinking and never sell ourselves or our profession short by letting the marketplace dilute our value as aviators. Protect yourself. Protect those who will follow in your footsteps. Have a good week. Take care. Fly safe. And I look forward to being with you again next week when we'll talk more about our history as aviators.